Um, so I'm going to jump into my introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be talking as this is a Wednesday, and that is because it's going to be airing on a Wednesday. We're not sure what Wednesday yet, but mm -hmm. just in order, so that way when you're saying, okay, why are you talking about Wednesday? That's why! It's pretty close. <laughs> okay. it, well, it's, uh, yeah, I guess tomorrow's Wednesday. Oh, sorry. Uh, radiation took a bit out of me this morning. And yeah. I'm just slowly coming down from it, so... Good Wednesday morning on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host. Is that bothering you? Do you want me to turn it off? I'm just wondering if the mic picks it up. Oh, uh, just hit the button behind you then. It's on the top. Hey, let's do that. Okay, let's try this again. Good Wednesday morning on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and this is day three of Transgendered Week here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. And I am pleased and honored to have Cece Chow, entrepreneur, activist, photographer, filmmaker, all around amazing human being on the show to talk about transgendered issues here in the province of Alberta, but also her story. Cece, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, I started every episode off this week with the exact same question. Um, who is Cece? That, that's a pretty interesting question. Um, I think over the, the last three years, I have also, hmm, more than three years, but maybe four years. I have also been asking sort of that question because um, I I came out uh, to myself August 2018, so it hasn't really been that long, and um, since that time I've spent a lot of time discovering myself and learning who I am when I'm when I'm no longer forced to wear the mask of this m masculine persona that I have put together sort of over, over a lifetime um, or half a lifetime or whatever you want to call it, like what, 40, um, 40, 40 years or whatever. Um, but I think in the end, I'm a s storyteller. I think it's important for us to tell our stories because that's how we connect. That's how we connect with the future. That's how we connect with our youth. That's how we connect with people who don't know us, who have no, you know, sort of prior exposure to, to us. So let's talk about prior to 2018 the journey to coming out to yourself and discovering who C.C. Chow was. As a child, did you have moments when you thought, my outsides don't match my insides, my insides don't match my outside? Or was it later on in life when, in 2018, you thought to yourself, I, I don't feel like who I'm, the person who I look in the mirror is not the person who I actually am. So for me, that it's always been a part of my story, let's say. Um, although, you know, when, when I was, I don't know, how old was I? Probably eight or nine um, in elementary school and refusing to wear the and like I grew up you know sort of late 70s 80s um and so at that time you know boys pants came in like like corduroys and jeans and the corduroys were like dark brown and like dark green and um there came a time where I refused to wear those pants and um I wanted to wear the, the colorful pants that the girls got to wear. And like at that age, I didn't understand what that was. I just knew that like, oh, these blue jeans and, 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 um, corduroys, these, I'm, I'm don't like these, you know, I, I want to, 
I want to be in the pants that the girls are in. And um, my mother, bless her soul, um, sort of made it happen. So I got like yellows and strangely white pants um, and like some gray pants, I think, um, in, in cotton. Um, and that's sort of my earliest memory of, 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 I don't know if you want, like gender nonconformity. I kind of try to avoid using that term because it's like, oh, what are we, what are we conforming to? Like, what's that standard? But um, I don't have a good alternative for that word. Um, and sort of through like junior high and high school, you know, I went through um, times where it's like I got really into cycling and and I started shaving my legs and then and for specifically for a, a race that I was in and then I, you know because it's like the excuse is oh it's gonna make me fast aerodynamics <laughs> and I just kept my legs shaved from then on and I always had this excuse of oh I'm a cyclist um and then um you know I I'd always flirted you know sort of I guess in terms of like fashion and presentation I always flirted with the the line of like feminine and masculine and it was always like how feminine can I go and not get in trouble and I I still you know sort of um junior high high school like I didn't really understand like what that was and um, and then in university, I had grown my hair out, um, sort of shoulder length, and I oh, I loved my hair long. Um, and I used to get um, like, oh, you know, in quotes, mistaken for a girl. Um, unbeknownst to those strangers, they were right. Um, but that you know that didn't bother me you know when when they're like oh excuse me ma'am and be like oh uh sir and the ma'am didn't bother me okay. and so for you know for for a typical dude and be like what why would you even say that i'm a dude just like back off right um but i was just kind of like okay i'll take that um and so it it just wasn't super conscious and there was just so little representation at the time um to be like oh like that like i am transgender and i can live life a different way you know i just kind of did a lot of growing up being like i'm a freak and i'm not like everybody else and being a boy is so hard. I'm working. I have to work so hard at being a boy. Um, so what was the, and I hate to use this word, uh, I hate to use a statement, but it seems to be a statement that, that applies to a lot of things in life. What was the come to Jesus moment? What was the moment when you thought you, you realized in your heart, in your body, that I, I do like being called man? those strangers weren't wrong like you said they weren't wrong i am a man what was that moment for you you talked about 2018 when you had your official coming out but mm -hmm. what was that moment um so it definitely wasn't when i came to jesus <laughs> <laughs> i apologize for that that, <laughs> that really like you know kind of push things back i think um quite a lot i think a lot of people could say that. yeah um but it was, you know, like it was in the shower, you know, my, I was taking my morning shower and it's the same morning shower I take every morning, you know, my, you know, spouse at the time was still in bed. Like I, I was always the first one to get up and, you know, I, I had shampooed my hair and got, you know, got the conditioner up there and then soaping up and in that moment like I like looked down and was just so struck struck by um 
the wrongness of having a penis attached to my body and and I proceeded to have a panic attack and I rinsed off as quick as possible so that I could get out of the shower and cover up um, and I was never the type of person to panic you know in an emergency I was always the coolest head in the bunch and checking to make sure everybody's safe and we're not in danger and then it was like okay now we can freak out um, so I was never the first one to freak out and for me to just freak out, um, that was kind of a big deal and it really made me look at it and, um, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody right off the bat. Um, so just to, just to back up here for a second, I, I just want to make sure I've clarified, I, I, mm -hmm. I heard you correctly, but you're, you were with somebody at the time when this happened. Yeah. I had been married for, you were married. I apologize. Yeah. Married for hmm, 17 years. Wow. Two kids. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This is, this, this, I, I'm so happy that we, we've connected because this has taken a complete new moment for me where I can learn a little bit more. And I'm so happy that you reached, it reached out and you're able to do this because this is a lot and there are people out there like yourself who have gone who are going through this right now as we speak who are looking in the shower and going whoa so after that moment after that moment in the shower a lot of feelings must have come up for you and a lot of mixed emotions must have come up because I, I don't want to put myself in your shoes because I don't want to say things that are inappropriate. So I please apologize. And if I do say something inappropriate, please tell me completely, Chris, you're out to left field right now. Was there a moment after that shower experience when you said, I need to get this out of my head. I need to bury it. I need to just move on and not think that way. Or was there a moment when, no, this is, this is it. I, I, I now realize what I need to do and where I need to go in the world. And that was kind of my, this is it. You know, I'd, I'd never experienced my gender dysphoria so intensely before, but it's not, you know, what, like I knew, like when that happened, I was like, oh, okay, this is gender dysphoria. And like, I knew what that meant, you know, but I wasn't on, on that morning. I wasn't, you know, well, I wasn't ready for it, but like, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, okay, this is gender dysphoria. And that, that means I'm trans. Um, at that, it took me sort of a couple days. Um, and I was, you know, kind of internally processing through it. Um, and on the following Sunday, I don't know, it was like four days later, I woke up, you know, at midnight in bed and uh, with flashbacks of some of the stuff that I shared earlier of like being in elementary school and university and, um, and being like, those never made sense to me. But if I look at them with the lens of, you're trans, then all of the things make sense. Then I'm not, I'm not a freak. I'm not a pervert. I'm just a woman. And, um, and then I quietly had a, a panic attack on my side of the bed. <laughs> um, because I didn't have answers for my then wife. Um, you know, normally I would just, like I could just wake her up and be like, I'm, I'm freaking out. I'm just like, I'm having a hard time with this. Um, but I couldn't do that when I didn't really have answers, um, for her cause she was going to have questions. Um, but there've been so many, you know, sort of previous moments where it's just like, ah, oh, like, I think this is a thing, but it's like, no, like I, ha I have a wife. I have to, you know, like I, 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 I love my wife and I love my kids 
Like, I can't, I can't do this to them. Like, well, what's going to happen, you know, if, if I'm like, oh yeah, I'm trans and, and like suddenly everything changes. Um, but this, this time it was kind of like, I think if I don't do this, I, I might die. What do you mean by that if you don't mind me asking? Um, like, I just... Did you have a touchy... For those who are listening, I, I, I do just please bear with me, but did you have suicidal thoughts? Um, I... It's something that I struggled with since junior high. Yeah. And thinking that they were normal. I didn't I didn't learn until quite a bit later. It's like, whoa, not everybody goes, you know, to school and it's like, you know, their school self and then goes home and goes to the dark place. Like I thought that was kind of normal, but um th like that's another reason why representation of all all types is really really important. And that's why I hope that this this for those who have been listening all week this this week helps not only people like myself who are trying to learn and trying to educate themselves because representation does matter and hearing stories like this does matter, but hopefully it does help somebody who is listening right now who is struggling as well, who is going to those dark places because they don't have somewhere to turn and they are trying to figure out what it all means. So I hope the stories this week help and you know that over the last few days and even tomorrow and Friday, people have done it. And there are people out there like Cece who can help. And I'm assuming you're open to conversations with anyone who is struggling right now. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about the first person. Because the first person is always the hardest. The first, actually, you, telling yourself is always the hardest. Yeah. Telling somebody else is a milestone. To open up to somebody and say, listen, the person you know is going through something. The person you know is not the person you know because inside doesn't match the outside. Who was that person for you? Um... It was actually um, one of my friends and there was at that time I was looking at opening like a co-working space uh, with one of my friends and we had it was probably like a Tuesday or Wednesday and we had gone to like take a look at this facility and just check it out you know just like to see how much construction we would need to do and stuff like that. And at the end of the, you know, the site visit, um, I don't know. I was just like, okay, like if we're going to go into business, I'm like, y you need to know. And she was like, wow, well, what's going on? And, um, so I kind of, you know, went through the, the, the sort of the story that I shared with, you know, being in the shower and stuff and, um, and it didn't, it was like, I felt like I, I had a responsibility <laughs> as a, like a business person um, because it was just like, okay, like this is a, this is a big deal. And, um, and it was like, if they're not okay with me being like this, you know, being who I am, then, well, we can't, we can't do business, right? Um, but, you know, that turned out to be an unfounded fear um she was very supportive and 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 like very understanding and um I actually spent that first week after I came out to myself coming out to all like my closest girlfriends um because I was desperate to find out who was going to be there and who wasn't going to be there so it wasn't that quick of a turnaround from or is the moment you came out to yourself, how long between the epiphany in the shower to the moment you came out, or were they the same uh, day? 
not the same day. So I came out to myself in the shower. I think it was a Wednesday. And then there was the... The Sunday when you woke the up. The Sunday. And then, like, the week after that was just, like, trying to connect with my girlfriends and being like, we, uh, we need to talk. I, because... Did you, did you find this... I am so, I'm so engaged with this conversation. This, I apologize if I interrupt, but I just, I, there's so many questions going through my head right now because mm -hmm. that's a lot to do in a week period. Like you, how are you standing here right now? Because I, I like, I buy sh like jeans and it takes me a week and a half to realize if I've done the right thing by buying jeans and you are making a massive life altering decision, not decision, but you're making life altering moments. In such a short period of time, how are you like? How are you the person you are today? Because you seem like you're so like strong hands headed, and you're just how. <laughs> I mean, at that time, I was just I so desperately needed to know that I wasn't going to be alone. You know, like it's like. Oh, I I might lose my parents. I might lose my my spouse, and you know my my family and my relatives, and probably almost all of the church, um, and like sort of all the friends associated with past church and and things like that. And I I needed to know. If there was going to be, you know, like a person, at least just one person, even if I lost everything else. Um, and it was kind of like, if I have that one person, like a person, then I, I think I can get through this. So let's go back to that moment. You're talking to your business, your potential business partner. Mm -hmm. You have that conversation with her correct mm -hmm. was it what you were expected to happen or were was there was it a little bit more uh, just talk me through the moment when when the words came out of your mouth and what her reaction was I think you know for her you know she she listened to my story you know just kind of quietly and we were like standing in a park that was like near the um near where I had parked my car and um I I remember it was like sunny and like warm and but she just listened and um, and it was just the, like the, the care in her eyes. Like I was pretty scared, you know, I was like, oh, am I going to lose a friend? Um, and it was such, uh, it was such a relief to be able to, share who I am with her and for her to be like yeah and we're friends still to this day you're still yeah friends. that's awesome yeah over that week period when you were telling your story to people and coming out to as you said find out who your friends were mm -hmm. I mean this in all do with respect did you lose any not in that first week like not not in that group okay. um, I've since lost a lot of friends but um, those you know I think it was how many it was like I came out to a person like every day for a week you know hmm maybe five or six, to five, five days. Um, but everybody was like really, was really supportive. And, you know, um, 
one of my favorite responses was, of course. Like, and um, I did have a response of just one. And this is one of my friends that moved out to Vancouver Island. And she was like, I've kind of been waiting for you. Like, you know, for her, it was like, well, what took you so long? Yeah. Wow. I can imagine that was probably a little bit of a whoa moment when people around you are saying, we, we, we've known, but we've been waiting for you to tell us that. I, I can't imagine that being easy, but also it must be enlightening at, at the same time that people like tell are willing to be open with you as well to say mm -hmm. we've known and we just want you to take the time to tell us wow. yeah i always used the thought that i'd hidden everything so well <laughs> never the case no when i came out to my father he said the exact same thing he said um really <laughs> really like <laughs> really so i can imagine telling friends and telling loved ones two separate entities mm -hmm. I will leave your partner until later on and your kids until later on let's talk about your immediate family your mother and father actually let's let's do it in chronological order who did you tell first I told my younger brother so I have one younger brother so you, you told your younger brother first yeah so supportive was he shocked he was pretty surprised um he was also very supportive um n sort of not educated on trans issues which it's not surprising but um he was very supportive uh growing up because of the four-year difference you know i was always the i was always the you know sort of the defender and um you know the one sort of standing up for him and he very quickly reversed those roles on me and he became the the defender and um the he, he was very much like you know if you need me to talk to mom and dad or whatever for whatever reason you know i can do that for you and um that that was kind of a big uh, that was kind of a big deal, yeah. Having family like that is can sometimes be a blessing and a curse because they <laughs> will always say, have you told mom and dad yet? Have you told mom and dad yet? Because I remember, and yet again, it's your story and not mine, but uh, when I told my brother, it was, I, I can't keep this secret. You need to tell them now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't spill the beans. So um, the after you told your brother the process must have gotten a little bit easier because now one of your loved ones knows or was the big one still your mom your dad and your partner at the time so i mean i i came out to my my ex-partner first before any of my immediate sort of family because so before your brother before you my brother yeah oh, okay so um because I, I felt like I owed it to her to hear from me um, so, first before what, anybody else. What yeah. was that moment like? Because the person you're married to is the person you should be able to trust in. And to tell someone a big secret like this, because one, it wasn't, let's, I don't, I'm not sure if I should call it a secret or. I mean, it was, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, I just I hate putting words in other people's yeah. mouths so because I know some people will describe it differently but having that and telling them is a massive moment in any relationship I want you to describe to me that moment when you told your wife that the person you married is a woman I think it took me it took me like six weeks to work up the courage to to do it 
in that six weeks I lost like 10 pounds because I wasn't able to eat um, I was just so anxious that um, anytime I tried to eat I would just want to throw up and um, so I'd lost a lot of weight um, I sometimes wonder if when I sat on the bed that night and was like what we need to we need to talk like I wonder if she thought that I was sick for having lost so much weight because I was like I'm five nine and I was like 126 pounds at the time so like really skinny and my face was all like skeletony like kind of sunken in um like um but you know she read the sort of the seriousness of the atmosphere right away and um and I told the the shower story and the elementary school story and the junior high and high school and university stories and um and I watched her heartbreak as I told the stories like there's it only takes so far for for you know a person to be like oh I know what this is but I don't want to know what this is um and it's coming out isn't one of the great biggest regrets of my life but breaking her heart is the one of the biggest regrets of my life um but when I got through my story she looked at me and she said you know I I was prepared I was prepared for get out of the house how could you do this to me did you even think about the kids um and I had texted some of my girlfriends beforehand and I was like this I think this is the night and I might be mm -hmm. I might be at your door later tonight um but what after I finished my story, what she said, the first thing out of her mouth was, how are you going to get through this? This is going to be so hard for you. And I, I was not prepared for that. You know, I was not prepared to have this woman in front of me whose heart I just broke be like, hey how, how are you going to get through this and it wasn't she kept it you know sort of about me and not about her and she I don't know intuitively understood what a huge deal that was to me and made it made that the focus and didn't make her the the focus where it in in that situation it would be easy um and understandable you know for her to make it about her we pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show with a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You say the biggest regret was breaking her heart. Mm -hmm. In that moment, and yet again, I she was feeling at that moment I've never tried to in that moment when the words were coming out of her mouth could you sense the atmosphere change in the room where she knew something was up because like I said that there was severity in the room and the anxiety and the pressure but was there a, when you when the words came out her the stories the moment in the shower the high school story the junior high school story was there a moment when you could tell that the woman I've married is now looking at me differently I 
I don't know. I think in that moment, I just I, I don't that. think I was, you know, there enough to to like catch that sort of <laughs> no, nuance. I, no, yeah. understandable. Yeah. yeah. Um, you've alluded to your kids and mm-hmm. two, two, two boys, girls, two boys, as far as we know, two boys, as far as you know, I apologize. Yes. Two boys, two girls are in between, but two boys, as, as you know, um, what was the conversation between you and your wife at the time to tell them and how old were they at the, this moment? In... So they were eight and 12 at the time. And, um, we didn't, we didn't have a conversation about it that night. Okay. Um, we kind of just talked about, yeah, it was just sort of the stuff, um, between the two of us. And I probably talked about my parents a little bit. Um, and you know, I was like, I haven't told any of my family yet. I, I wanted you to know first. And, um, but she really left it up to me to to talk with the kids. Um, I don't know. Perhaps she just wasn't in a place to be able to to do it at the time. You know, sort of when it happened. Um, but I did come out to all of the. So my brother and then my mom and my dad, and then I came out to the kids because. I was like, well, if the kids ask questions, like if they ask grandma and grandpa, like what's going on, um, they're not going to have answers. Grandma and grandma should know how to answer this question or not be taken back. At at least not be taken by surprise. Yeah. Um, For the sake of the kids, you know. And and I understand. I completely understand that. That uh, uh, this is your story to tell and it was you did it in your way right these other people do it in their own way and this is your the way you chose to do it so after you tell your wife you tell your brother first yeah and then you go to your then go to mom and dad well then i went to mom then you went to mom first because dad just just felt really intimidating because i was like um so you know i was raised to be the like eldest male heir to the name you know of the family and like the extended family not just like our nuclear family it was like i was the sort of eldest boy golden child um like of all the cousins and like all the rest um and my dad is the youngest of all his brothers and so normally that would make him you know sort of the lowest rung on the ladder but um all of his older brothers had all girl children and so when i was born it was like suddenly you know my dad gets a boost to the top of the ladder um because there's a male heir to carry on the name and you know like all of that Um, sort of all of that stuff sort of Chinese culture and um, and so kind of having to tear that down I just I I, yeah it was just so intimidating so I I talked to my mom first and my mom went to at the time Alberta College of Art and I was like she 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 went to art school. She must have been exposed to so many queers. Like, it just felt maybe a little bit safer. And so we went out for we went for, we, we went out for coffee and and I told my story and um, it I didn't get disowned outright, which was you know sort of okay. Um, but I also you know, at that time, I really wanted, you know, that, it's like the one time you want a helicopter mom, like, but that, that's never really been my mom, but it's like, you know, I kind of had a need for, you know, that type of, like, reassurance and safety and, um, and, you know, sort of, 
I guess it is what it is, but like I that that wasn't what I got. Um, it was a little bit of a you know it's like okay uh, I I need to process this and um, you know the. Did you ask her not to tell your father? Yes. Do you think she did? Uh, no, <laughs> because we did have another communication. She's like, uh, when are you going to tell your dad? <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, it's like the, the secret thing where it's like, <laughs> I'm I, going to tell him if you don't, because it's going to slip out. Um, but it must yeah. mean, was it upsetting that your mother didn't play that role that you wanted her to play when you went into that conversation or looking back on it, do you look back and go, I understand where she was coming from. I, it was upsetting. Um, I understand that, you know, she is sort of the product of her upbringing and of her parents and of the culture that she grew up in. And like Chinese culture generally is not like touchy feely. It's like, you know, all the feelings and all the rest and just, it's just like, just sweep that under the rug and like, It'll just disappear if we don't look at it, you know? Um, and, and so, like, I, I understand it. Um, I do kind of wish it could have been um, different, but... Did you reach out I to your it. brother afterwards and say, Mom knows now? Yeah. In the process of telling your father he's the last one in the family the nuclear family that you have to tell mm -hmm. your mom is asking when are you going to tell your father um, you, you talked about the um, air of pride of having the first son and mm -hmm. having the uh, the name carried on it must have been nerve wracking to sort of not tell him but change his sort of look and outlook on his family and now you're going and saying dad we need to talk mm -hmm. so take me through that moment because I would be a nervous Nellie and just not wanting to say a word and just saying we need to talk and then just zipping my lips and saying so what was that <laughs> so how was it for you um so when I came with my parents, I was just like, okay, we're going to do it in a public place so that they can't, like, just have a nuclear meltdown. It's like you've been broken up a few times in a public place, but that's how I just got broken up with. Um, and, you know, I... Like, I'd always been, you know, like, of the you know my my brother and I you know my dad has spent lots of time with me growing up you know we went we went fishing and there was like camping and I don't know like badminton and just um and and I was like I think I'm gonna break all of those things even though those are really like those are still real experiences whether my gender identity is a boy or a girl like it doesn't it doesn't invalidate the experiences that we had right like you know if 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 I had been assigned female at birth like we still could have gone fishing and played badminton and just, I don't know chopped wood and like all those other things um but I was like I, I'm pretty sure you know this is gonna change the way that feels for him and, um, but I was just, I was just like, I have to do this. Like, I can't, it's, it's kind of like now that I really know, um, I can't, I can't lie. And, um, so I did it. I, I also printed out some like resources cause I was just like, I don't know if he's going to go like do the research on his own. So I printed out some stuff and. Like I gave that to him and, and, um, he, he's, when he listened to the story, he seemed, um, 
you know, he, he was, a, he, he went to like, are you sure? And, you know, when I described the experiences that I had and he was like, are you sure this is not, he didn't have the word for it, but like that it's not just confirmation bias. Um, and you know, like I, I kind of, I kind of get that, but, um, and then I had expressed where like that, you know, I was concerned about the rest of the extended family, you know, I'm like, I expect that's going to affect your relationship with, you know, your, your brothers and sisters and, you know, all the rest. And he kind of, at that moment, he went into like Papa Bear mode and he was like, don't you worry about the extended family, you know, I'll, I'll deal with them. Um, and I, I, I believe that he meant it. Um, but I don't think he really understood how much work that he needed to do internally himself to be able to do that, um, like on my behalf. Yeah. So this is still 2018, right? Yeah. What's your relationship like with your parents and your family now? Um, you know, it's been, it was like quite rocky. There was a time when there was not a lot of communication. And of course, you know, 2019, we headed into pandemic land and that made it even harder. Um, but my, I feel like my mom is really coming around. Um, it feels like it coincided with getting to a point in my transition where, you know, for lack of a better word, I pass. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, when I go to stores out on the street or whatever, people just read me as as a woman um, the way that I want them to um, and that felt like a turning point in in our relationship and I don't know we haven't really had a conversation around it but you're still on talking terms with we him are now. yeah um, it's hard to talk to my dad I think he he yeah he struggles with having a conversation <laughs> Yeah. Jumping back to the final coming out, the big coming out, the the kids. Mm -hmm. So you tell Grandma and Grandpa now, now you are going to sit down with your 8 and 12 year old and have the conversation yeah. with them. Kids can say the darndest things. <laughs> kids can oh, be yeah. kids can be interesting in a lot of good day. So mm -hmm. To have a serious conversation, I can just imagine when my parents had that serious conversation with me and my brother, it was probably a fun time because, let's be honest, if it, there's no Game Boy in front of me, I'm probably tuned out in the first five minutes mm -hmm. as a kid, as especially as an 8, 12-year-old. What was the process like coming out to your kids? So I, I did it separately. Okay. <laughs> I started with the oldest one first, yep. I'm assuming. Okay. Because, you know, once again, like if the youngest one has questions, it's gonna ask his older brother, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we went to Starbucks, we got hot chocolates, sat on the couch, and we had the, you know, it's basically telling the same story. Um, At this point in time, you must have been sick of that story. You must have been, okay, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I could just, yeah, it was like, I, like, you know, it was like, relatively well scripted um but like i didn't i didn't really water it down like kids are really smart yeah. they're they they understand a lot and it's just you know as long as we use vocabulary that they have they're gonna get it and um and so i tell the story and at the end of it you know i ask my 12 year old and i was like do you have any questions or you like, what are you feeling? And he was just like, he looks at me and he's like, there's just, there's just one thing I, I don't really understand. And I was like, Oh, okay. What is it? And he was like, but you like 
cars. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, well, girls can like cars. There's lots of girls that like cars. And I was like, there's girl race car drivers. And there's like girl drift car drivers. And, and they're really fast. And he was like, oh, yeah. Okay. That was it. Okay. Wow. How proud of you were you at that moment as a parent? That was that was so amazing. You know, it was just like and kids are primed for for learning, right? Like they don't ha like they don't have all of those stories around like trans people or queer people or whatever. They they just they're just like, "Oh, this is new." Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what they do at school every day. They, yeah. they go to school and they learn. Um, yeah, that's it's pretty amazing. Youngest child is next. Yeah, so we went to the same Starbucks, <laughs> sat on the same couches, had the, you know, hot chocolates, and I tell my story. And, and the eight-year-old afterwards, you know, I'm like, do you have any questions? How are you feeling? He stands up and he stares me straight in the eyes and he was like, you know, sometimes I feel uncomfortable about things too and it's like, it's okay. It's okay to feel that way. And then he gave me a big hug. And, you know, I'm like crying because my child of eight saw that his parent needed comfort and he was like, yeah, my parent needs comfort. I'm going to do that. Raise two remarkable kids. You're raising, I should say, yeah. two remarkable yeah. kids. Wow. Like, everybody always asks, like, well, what about the kids? And yeah. it's just like, it's, no, it's, you know, it's like never the kids. The kids are always, like, I I haven't talked to anybody who's, like, you know, where without outside influence that their kids are just, like, that's so wrong, you know, like. So the process of coming out has been, there's been ups and downs. Mm -hmm. But that's not where the story ends. The story ends now is the process of transitioning. Mm -hmm. There's first steps that you can take. Um, I'm assuming you started c trying to connect with the resources yourself to better understand, try to uh, learn a little bit more. In a conservative province like Alberta, like the... People say Calgary is progressive, but okay, we did elect our first female in October of 2021. Good. But there's still work to do. We still need to make it feel, we need to make people feel safe in the city, and that's the biggest thing. The process starts in 2019, I'm, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Right at, the, like, one year in, pandemic hit, so it sort of changes the name of the game but the process of transitioning for yourself was it rough was it hard especially in a conservative province um or did you have the resources you needed so yes and no um so let's start with the uh the no part because what was mm -hmm. the easy parts of the transition the you know i the there's so much mixed information out there and of course you're on google and trying to find all the things and it's hard to tell what's current and what's not current and um like you know people will talk about certain doctors or whatever and it's just like i don't know like i don't like what's reputable and what's not and um but i knew that after was basically after i came out to my kids i was just gonna start i was like i don't know if i'm gonna be able to get on hormones ever 
Um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to have um, like gender affirming bottom surgery. I don't know, but I need to transition. And um, so I just, I started like dressing differently. Like I like got rid of all my like boy pants and, you know, th bought three pairs of women's pants and um, not that you could tell at first. <laughs> I mean, my pants got really skinny, <laughs> um, pre even, you know, sort of pre coming out, but, um, the, and then I, the sort of the, you know, the clothes and the presentation, like that was easy for me. I always loved fashion. I was always the, the one who was just like, you know, in a group of guys, I was just a bit too fashionable. <laughs> yeah. But, and this is where, so uh, so for those who have been listening this week, I'm learning here. So I'm going to be asking some inappropriate questions, but I, 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 I don't know if they're inappropriate, right. right? Because this is the part of the show where I'm trying to learn. That moment, while you can be into fashion, Wearing women's clothes outside for the first time, was that daunting? Because I I can imagine that transitioning through this is challenging nonetheless, but in a conservative province, going out in attire that you have traditionally not that is gender affirming to the gender that you are could be challenging you talk about yes your pants just got a little bit skinnier but doing that the first time must have been hard wasn't it or was it easy and this this yet again these if you're going to send negative comments i do apologize because i'm just i'm trying to <laughs> learn because i don't know the stories and i want to learn the stories of It's a big moment that you are now out with the old and in with the new. Yeah. So how was it for you? I'll tell you a big secret. Okay, go ahead. I've been wearing women's pants for years. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> Breaking news. Um, my, so it wasn't the, that big of a change? No, like for, for pants, it wasn't... Um, but when I started, you know, when I traded my my button ups for blouses, um, it felt affirming, and it was like it, it just yeah, it always felt good until people started staring, um, and you know, early in transition. I wasn't on hormones yet and my I could walk by people or like you know past them I mean which they would stare and it would just be so off-putting and I got so frustrated with it that I decided that I was gonna start staring them back in the eyes because I'm just like at least they'll be they'll know that they're caught in the act and they'll look away <clears throat> But they didn't. They just kept staring. They like didn't even know that I was staring them back in the eyes. And, you know, I was basically watching their brains break and them trying to piece things back together and be like, where does this person fit in the, you know, in the world view that I have constructed? Um, and that, that was quite hard to get through um to be a spectacle everywhere that I walked um but it was like I can't I can't do otherwise you know and and sort of 
Um, you can't retreat back. No. And of all the progress you've made, yeah. I can't I can imagine that one step in front, and if you go two steps back, you might not get that step forward again. So I give you credit because I've heard story after story after story of similar situations like that where people are gawking. During the first few months of trans of your transition process, was there any hate? Was there any negative hate? Like verbal? I, 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 I hate I would hate to say physical, but we live in a weird society right now. But was there any physical or verbal abuse, hate thrown at your way? Yeah. Um the you know Washrooms is always this sticking point in, I don't know, just sort of tr just conservative viewpoints against sort of trans rights. Um, and, you know, like early in transition, I was just like, okay, like I don't, I'm like, I don't look feminine enough to not make a stir in the women's washroom even though the men's washroom feels really really unsafe for me um but i would use the men's washroom and you know i would be in there i would use a stall because like i don't want to be next to some you know guy at the urinal and like i'm, I'm not going to stand to pee um and you know you know i would have um, times where I would just be like washing my hands and like there would just be these dudes in the in the washroom and they would be just glaring at me with like violence in their eyes like just the threat of violence it's like the the if you make one wrong move you're dead meat and um, and I always just tried to get out as as quick as I could and like of course I tried to use like single stall gender neutral washrooms wherever I could but that doesn't always exist um and um that that was really that was really really scary um and it's a lot easier yeah, I mean, I just go to the women's washroom where I'm <laughs> supposed to go, um, and and you know, it's just I don't know. I I I have the privilege of being pretty. Um, you know, I I walk down the street and people looking at me. They're looking at me because because I'm tall and I'm thin and and um you know i have my makeup on and and um and you know i don't know like my my clothes are just, you know a bit stylish um and that's a huge privilege to be able to do that um but you know i did have um like an incident um fourth street by shelf life books I was crossing the street and this other guy this this guy was coming the opposite way and um and as we were passing he's like this big the big white guy and um as we we're walking by each other you know he just shouts at me at the top of his lungs and he's just like that's a dude dressed like a girl and and it was just like the it was so aggressive so loud so in my face and like so directed um uh i just like i freaked out and i was just like just just keep walking just keep walking but i was just i was 
bawling by the time I got to the other side of the street and I stood at like outside job like books and I I cried and there were you know there were other pedestrians and stuff and like I don't expect people to like stand up to like a big burly person who's you know sh shouting at the top of his lungs um but also nobody checked on me you know nobody was like hey are you okay like do you need to get somewhere do you need to call somebody um and i was just like on the way back to my store because i had to pick up something and um that was that was terrifying to feel like no one was i was there. alone it was just like i don't know like the to me as a as a trans woman the line between verbal assault and physical assault is razor thin like the 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 statistics are not great and the it's like you know i'm i'm very much an empath it's like the the energy like i can feel the energy and it's just like it's just i don't know it's not it's almost not different um and i'm i'm terrified of men like if if i if i see you on the street and you're a man like you're for me i live life walking on the streets and you are guilty of being that same guy who verbally assaulted me on the street or who might sexually assault me and then discover that I'm trans and then kill me. You are guilty until proven innocent because I can't afford to live any other way. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. You have me thinking now. I mean, I, I've been thinking through the entire thing. Don't, don't, for those who are just saying that I'm not, but you have me. You have me second guessing the last 35 years of my life. Was I that person who walks by somebody who was struggling? And I hope I wasn't. I really hope I wasn't. And I'm not trying to make apples out of oranges here because there are, there are people out there struggling right now. And the fact that you went through that stop to say are you okay tells us more about us as a society than that person who yelled at you mm -hmm. um, we live in a society where trans Albertans Transgender Albertans are more likely to be attacked verbally, assaulted physically, and we turn a blind eye at it. We, and I, I say the royal we because I'm just using your story as an example. People walk by. People who get attacked every day and don't think to stop and check in. But there has to be good in this society. There has to be moments where in the last 
every year and a half years since August 2018 when we came out. And you started this transition where you thought, for all the crap, for all the bad out there, there's a silver lining. Because I hope someone who's listening to this right now who is feeling at wit's end that something they might, they, they can't go through what you've been so strong to go through. What's the silver lining? What is the moment? Is it the sons that you talked to and you came out to and they said, hey, well, girls don't like cars. <laughs> or what, what's the silver lining in this? Because there can't be all bad. And I hope there's not all bad when I ask this question. It, I mean, it definitely isn't all bad. Like, in coming out and in transition, I... I have found me, you know, like just spending so much <clears throat> of my life, um, like, and, and like, so when I came out, I was like, I was 42, right? So later in life and, um, you know, I'd spent so much of my life just pretending trying to convince people that I was something or someone that I wasn't, um, you know, sort of to just to survive and to come to a place where, um, where I can be truthful about who I am and like sort of I... I finally started like dating um, like three months ago when I, you know, I was at a place where I was like, who, who is going to, who's going to want to date somebody, you know, quote unquote, like me, as if, as if like me is a bad thing. Um, and, you know, that's, that's sort of sort of this internalized like you're less than because everybody tells you you're less than but you know I, I met this amazing woman and she she loves me for who I am and she came into this like with her eyes open and um, and in that relationship for the first time in my life I have had uh, like sort of this truly authentic relationship. I've never had a relationship before like this because I've never been able to show up like this. I've never been able to be me. I always had to hold back who I was in a relationship um, with my parents, with my brother, with, with um, like lovers. And, you know, suddenly it's like, Oh, I get to be me and I get to be loved as me and in a real very real sense it's like I have never been fully loved until now but I have it now yeah that must be powerful that you finally feel accepted for who you are but loved for who you are as well There's a question I've, I've been wanting to ask, and I hope it doesn't doesn't come across the way that I hope it. Do, I don't want it to come across, but I'm going to ask it. Um, being in 2021, when we record this. In October of 2020, it's November, 20, November of 2021, mm -hmm. when we record this, we have made great strides, strides as, as a society to be more accepting and more welcoming. That moment when 
you were out as CC Chow and you were identified as CC Chow as a woman by a stranger not sorry sir sorry dude but how are you now you talked about that time in at the opening statements when you were in university and people saying sorry ma'am oh well mister I apologize for that first time when you were identified as a man from a stranger from someone you didn't know was that reaffirming yes that was really affirming um the it it's kind of this do you remember when it was i don't okay um but it was probably just at the grocery store or you know just some little thing um it's always just like some little you know kind of offhand um situation um and it's it's kind of like this the first time it happens it's sort of like oh like this can be like the the reality that i hope for is possible where Um, where before that, you know, getting misgendered all the time, um, and it's like, like, will this ever get better? Like, will it, will I ever be seen for who I actually am? Um, and, and, and yes, it's very affirming, but at the same time, there's this, there's this element of like, but it's just because of how I look. You know, like, it's just because the the clothes that I wear and, like, the the shape of my body and the, the makeup that I put on and the, the voice that I've trained, um, and, and those things have been really easy for me. And it's like, but those things shouldn't, those things shouldn't, those things shouldn't matter. We shouldn't assume gender. We, like for me, early in tradition, it's just like, yes, I identify as a woman but nobody is going to see me that way. Um, and so it's just, it, it, it feels weird to be like, oh, that's so affirming, but at the same time, it's like, oh, that's, that's kind of shitty that we, that we profile people's gender in that way. You are CC Chow. I want to know the name, the story behind the name. Because before, in our pre interview, CC and I were chatting and I asked her about her name because I, 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 I want to do the best that I can do. And I did my research, I went mm -hmm. on your social media, and I was confused at first because in some of the videos that are there, you used another name and I, I i did my due diligence and i asked prior to this interview so the name cc where does it come from so and can you take me through the process of accepting who cc is because mm -hmm. you, you you started to talk and i sort of interrupted you and i said don't tell it until we <laughs> have the chance to talk about it but using a different name using your real name which is now CC, mm -hmm. and that is the only one that I will ever call you by until I leave this great earth. But using a different name from what you originally have, have known is a change. And what was the process for you changing 
who who they were to who she is a Susie. I mean, I originally when I came out, I was like, I am going to keep my birth name. It's um I don't advertise it, but if you look for it, you'll find it. Um and 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 so like it it starts with C. Okay, that's part of the story. Um and you know, I was I I like my birth name because it's also my Chinese name. Um and and so my mom did this thing where it's like our our names, our our English names sound like our Chinese names. And so it's just it's just my name. And I had fully intended on just keeping my birth name and like continuing to use my birth name. Um, you know, the, like, like into transition and going forward. Um, but I was finding that as, as my body feminized, and as my like you know for like for boys um trans men if they're on testosterone the testosterone like thickens their vocal folds and they their voice is lower generally um and the amount that it lowers kind of depends um for trans women the opposite is not true hrt does not thin out the vocal folds and um like our voices just will we'll just stay the same like it doesn't change on hrt and for those who don't know sorry to interrupt but hrt stands for hormone replacement therapy okay perfect sorry i just wanted to make sure yeah. that i was not thinking of something else so hormone replacement therapy yeah. thank you continue i apologize um that's a good clarification um and so for trans women like Unless we started with a voice that was, you know, like, um, less stereotypically masculine, um, to achieve a more feminine voice, we have to train our voices. And it's amazing what you can do with your voice. If you go far enough back in my social media, you can find some of my videos with my old voice and it's a big difference. Um, but like with the way that I... I look and I present now and um, the you know the way that I sound I was encountering situations where my name was causing problems um, it's it's like it's quite a ma like some people are like mm, it doesn't seem like a masculine name to me but it's like biblically it's a masculine name and um, and so I would like order a pizza and I would be the only person in the shop and they would not call my name because they're like, oh, there's no person by this name here. There's just this woman standing there. <laughs> Sorry, friends. <laughs> I wave my hands around when I talk and I hit the microphone. Um, and so I would have situations where people wouldn't recognize me or they wouldn't believe that my birth name was my name and it's just to have to try to explain it every time that it's like oh well that's that's my Chinese name you know that was my cover story or whatever it's true but um, the best cover stories are and and then there and I was like, ah, I don't know, what am I going to do? And so I decided to start introducing myself as Cece, which those are were my initials because my last name is Chow, starts with C. And so it was like Cece, right? And it's like, it's just my initials. So it's still, it's still my name. Um, and... Um, and then there were like times where I would get, I was like being gendered correctly and then misgendered because somebody learned my name. And it was just so 
hard to handle. And um, so, you know, I was going by this nickname of CC. And like, I thought, I thought that was going to be okay. You know, officially, you know, my birth name is going to stay my birth name. It'll be on my ID, whatever. And then um, I got a call from the police because they're like, we need to serve you a subpoena to be a witness for what this court case. Um, and like, but they were like, can we speak to so-and-so? And I was like, yeah, that's me. Right. And they're like, uh, okay. And so they tell me the story and, 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 and then they couldn't deliver the subpoena that day. And they called again, same cop called again and then they called and they were just like they were just making a mess of the name they were like they were just like stumbling over it and then they were like oh, I think I'm just pronouncing your name wrong like uh, how do you say it and so I explain it and that and they were like gonna come to my house and deliver the subpoena and that had me that had me freaked out I was just like oh uh, like like what what does the cop now think you know like are they and like at this point like my gender markers and everything are changed um and sometimes people just can't yeah they're just like this is a masculine name and yeah and and so i had like 30 minutes like they were like yeah we'll be there in like 30 minutes and i was already like ready for bed you know i was in my big sweater and and um and i was just like oh and then i i was like so i i went and i got changed and i put on my like little lululemon shorts and my lululemon hoodie that's like quite um form-fitting and a push-up bra because i was like i just i need to present as femininely as possible like I don't want to be misgendered by the police because they are in this position of power and I don't know who this police yeah. officer is I don't know how they're going to treat me and that that was the incident where I was like I don't think I can keep my birth name and I was really upset about it for a while because that's not something that I wanted to do I didn't want to change my birth name and but it just it did not feel safe and it was like in the future if I'm traveling like I don't want to be detained in some foreign airport because my name is masculine and they don't believe that I am who I am even though my photo matches my passport and my other ID and yeah um and I felt painted into a corner and I was like I guess I guess I have to do this to to feel safe and it was like it was like this thing where it was like the the systems win this time um and i don't know i guess i you know since then you know i've kind of taken ownership of it but the sort of the 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 genesis of the name the legal name change was not completely in your control it, yeah it wasn't it wasn't great yeah you have gone through a lot in the last few years since august of 2018 when you had that shower while it's hard to play hindsight 50 50 are you happier are you more it are you in a better place than you were on that fateful Wednesday or Tuesday Thursday morning when you had that shower? Ultimately, 
yes um you know while while i had many sort of beautiful moments in sort of pre coming out me um being able to find myself has been really it's been so freeing like to actually be able to be who I am um, and I think and I think that's not just you know sort of in this LGBTQ um, you, you know to two spirit um, context like it's it's so beautiful when you can be authentic and it's crushing when you have to hide who you are and you know there's been a lot of really hard things and I'm still going through lots of hard things now and like learning a lot especially in in sort of this new relationship that I'm in um, with my girlfriend but there's also so much happiness and like in a way that I've never been able to experience before. Take a moment right now. Talk to the talk to the comedian, the little child, the forty year old over in the twenty five year old over in who who has just had that moment shower moment but in their own context who would you say to them right now about the process that they're about to undertake if they're about to go through what you have gone through in 2018 I think first of all congratulations on coming to a place where you know who you are that's a really big deal it's not easy and you made it. The, the journey that you are going to go on now is going to be hard as fuck. But at the same time, you don't have to be alone as conservative as Alberta is there is an amazing small community of trans people and queer people who will see you just the way you are and with whom you will you don't have to hide and it's okay if it's not safe for you to just come out and you know you know flying the rainbow flags all over the place that's okay. You should um, you should be careful about it and 
but at the same time know that you you aren't alone and there are great um, Alberta organizations where you can get support um, my I'm a little biased but um, you know sort of one of my favorites is Skipping Stone Foundation in Calgary um, and I was so lost for resources and things like that um, until I got connected with them and they work with people of you know all ages and they have their finger on the pulse of the politics, the the things that are going in the, on in the medical community, and um, they're kind of this hub in Alberta, um, connecting people to resources. And so, you know, even if you may or may not have friends to go to, or you're just looking for that extra support from a group of people who will understand your experience um organizations like skipping stone are are amazing giving stone or skipping stone skipping stone skipping stone okay it's easy oh thank you um thank you for telling your story for opening up for sitting down and chatting um, I hope I hope my listeners my viewers have gotten something out of this I know I have I am now second guessing my whole life of if I've walked by someone uh, who might have been struggling and moving forward I know I'll never do that because they might be going through something that is more than what it looks like. Um, I, 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 I should have asked you this before the interview started, but for those who have listened and uh, uh, watched the show before, Cece's social media information, her Instagram is going to be in our show notes. So please, if you need someone to speak to, CC is a great resource. She has uh, done a lot in three years, and she has an amazing, amazing attitude compared to what I originally had planned when I started talking to transgendered Albertans this week. I thought it was going to go one way, but I am learning, and I am so impressed by the resilience that women like you have cc so thank you thank you so much for doing this and thank you so much for spending the last hour and 40 minutes chatting it's been an honor and it's been a pleasure so thank you thank you it's um Just, yeah, I, I thank you for opening your platform for these types of conversations. Um, I really do think that representation is our way forward to connecting us all. Um, and it helps us to find commonality um, where we may not have known that we had that commonality and, and we can draw together in that. I appreciate that. Um, to my listeners and to my viewers, as I've stated, uh, CC's information will be in the show notes. I highly recommend you go and ch check her out. Follow her on Instagram. That's where I am uh, following her, but also tune in tomorrow. We have another great episode, another great interview, um, and I, I hope this platform this week has educated even just one person 
because that's where education starts with just one person. For everyone here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast, have yourself a safe and wonderful rest of your Wednesday, and we'll be back tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning for another great episode. For everyone here, talk to you later.